Welcome to the Let Me Save You 25 Year Podcast, where we break down a new Seanism each week in hopes that you can maybe learn from my mistakes and build great things bigger, better, and faster than I ever did, perhaps shaving off a decade or two. You never know. My book, by the same name, is coming out this year, so stay tuned. I'm your host, Sean D. Nelson, founder of Lovesack, and with me today is one of the biggest personalities in podcast land and in the interwebs of social media. He is the author of a number one bestseller on Amazon called The Fifth Vital, a brutally candid characterization of the opioid crisis through the eyes and personal experiences of the author. When I first met him, he left a lucrative career as a dog walker to help me on social media with my social media. Since then, he's gone on to amass millions of loyal followers for himself across every social media platform and YouTube and build his own brand into something incredible. He is a creative. He is an entrepreneur. He's a business person, a personality, of course, and a great friend. The one, the only, hey, big Mike, Mike Malak. Dude, wow. In the that was, that, I usually don't like the intros. I feel sometimes like, uh, like somebody singing, you know, when you feel when somebody's uh, singing happy birthday to you and you don't really know what to do with your hands and you're kind of right. like sitting there, but that was a good one, man. That was, that was fantastic. And you know, it's, it's, it's dude, you were such a, uh, you know, a, a beginning, you know, step for me in, in, in being where I am. So it's, it's great to reconnect and, and to sit and chat with you and have time to catch up. So I'm, I'm happy to be here, dude. In fact, you know, to kick off. So today is, uh, Seanism, just do the next thing, right? My, my number one Seanism, just do something. Like in my case, I made a big bean bag, right? Uh, chapter two of the book, just do the next thing. Like business is complex. I mean, insurance, contracts, attorneys, you're into it, man. I know you're into it. Constantly. And what's crazy is both you and I are living proof that any idiot can do it. And that's <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. I guess if you want to put it like that, I mean, I mean, I guess unless that's one full, way, to unless it's full unmitigated projectile vomiting. Yeah. If you're going to go absolutely puke, then, then you can do that. Um, keep it in, but, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess, I guess every, uh, I think you, I think you used to say this sometimes. I think you have to be a little bit crazy to, to, you know, do things the way that we have, you know, for you to, to want to break the mold in the space that you're in for me to want to, you know, move across the country from everything that I knew and do, do what I'm doing now. I think you have to be maybe not an idiot, but like a little bit, you know, off your rocker to want to devote your entire being to one passion, one goal, one pursuit. But like, if you look at anybody that's become great in any space, like it's that, that is the fact of the matter. I mean, you look at, you know, not to compare myself, but like, obviously, but if you look at LeBron, you look at, you know, any of these people that have become the greatest to have ever done anything. Not that I would say LeBron is, cause I guess there's Jordan, but, uh, <laughs> that's, that, that's fighting words for some hot take, hot take for you. But, but you know, to be the greatest, like you have to, you have to be kind of in a way an idiot in it by, by me. I love that. I, I love that you're actually Morning. using that phrase because it's something that comes up in that book a lot. A few different times yeah. where um, I actually have a chat. One of the Seanisms is mind the experts, and and it's a double edged. It's a double entendre, right? On the one hand, you need experts. Like I guarantee you've got an expert attorney behind the scenes helping you. On the other hand, if you listen to that attorney in every realm, you would never do anything because no, they would tell you no, <laughs> right? And so you have to be dumb enough to kind of be like, well, why not? Right. Like all the people that told me that like this couch invention would never work. It would never be comfortable. I, I talk about some of those examples in the book and how I was just kind of dumb enough that, um, to say, well, why not? Well, why not? And keep saying that until something worked. And so I think there is something to remaining naive and kind of like not jaded by all of your experience. Like all of a sudden you're like, uh, an influencer extraordinaire, You've had things go viral. You've, you know, you've been a part of some of the biggest movements on, you know, in, in all of uh, social media, all that. But you still, I think, I'm guessing you still have to remain naive enough to believe that uh, it's not like you, you, you have an exact formula for it. And it's not like the younger kid or whoever might not have a better idea that sh you should be heard, right? Well, I mean, the, the, the good thing about my situation that you didn't really, like, 
to be honest, have the luxury of is everything is a little bit easier when there's trailblazers that came before you. And so like, by the time I started creating my own content, by the time Logan and I started our podcast, Logan and Casey Neistat and all these people had all been through the throes of this terrible, you can't do that. Like there's no career there. You're never going to make money there and had already mm-hmm. created this vast universe of sponsorships and brand deals and, and creating IP and, and getting these millions of views and b- creating relationships with the platform and doing all the, all the, the, the backbreaking work in the face of doubt so that I didn't have to do that. I actually have a chat. One of the Seanisms is mind the experts and, uh, and it's a double edged, it's a double entendre, right? On the one hand, you need experts. Like I guarantee you've got an expert attorney behind the scenes helping you. On the other hand, if you listen to that attorney in every realm, you would never do anything because they would tell you no, (laughs) right? And so you have to be dumb enough to kind of be like, well, why not, right? Like all the people that told me that like this couch invention would never work, it would never be comfortable. I I talk about some of those examples in the book and how I was just kind of dumb enough that um, to say, well, why not? Well, why not? And keep saying that until something worked. And so I think there is something to remaining naive and kind of like not jaded by all of your experience. Like all of a sudden you're like uh, an influencer extraordinaire. You've had things go viral. You've, you know, you've been a part of some of the biggest movements on, you know, in in all of uh, social media, all that to do. So I I was, I was a little bit lucky in that sense. It, you know, not completely. I sure dealt with it as well, but just not maybe on the level that you did. No, no. Look, I think, uh, look, I mean, in fairness, you, so, so let's, let's give the context. I want, I'd love you to, let's start here. Tell, uh, tell, tell people, I want to hear from your words. Tell people real quick how we before met you, before and, you and ask, where it, where it kind of went. The short version, not, not, not necessarily the long version. Go ahead. I have to preface with this. I'm sorry. All right. The one thing that I like to claim, because I can't <laughs> claim that I have the most followers. I can't claim that, you know, I have the, I'm the best looking. I can't claim this or that. But one thing that I can claim is I probably have the craziest story in creator, right? Like, like I don't need, yeah, guaranteed. Guaranteed. Like, Like, dude, like every facet, like even if you take something as, you know, recent as my relationship with the world's number one adult actress, you know, like that, that. Some people look at that as a defining moment of my life, but that's just one little speck of sand in this insane story of addiction and despair and ICU units and brand marketing and, and, and everything. And, uh, you know, writing a best-selling book, starting one of the biggest podcasts in the world, you know, all of these things, you know, uh, combined have created this, this intense and and very strange life and storyline. And so like that would be the only thing I ever wish to be able to like have a trophy and hoist it. It's like the most WTF life. I agree. In the space. Well, part, I think part of the reason I wanted you for this topic too, is because, um, you know, when, as I reflected on, on people that have had just found a way to do the next thing, like what a better example, right? Because, I, and it's so ironic too, because you, you know, you, you, you put me up there and say, oh my gosh, look what you've done in this category, real business guy, whatever inventor or something where I hired you to be my social media guy. And to this day, you know, decades in, and this is, this is with all of the, um, momentum of, I had won a reality TV show on a, on a network. I buddies with billionaires. I have a, you know, now a billion dollar company and I'm still an embryo in social media. I am still a failure on platforms, whatever. You know, if you look at it that way and, 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 and you, my, you know, unpaid intern in the closet have gone on to become like the social media mogul. So it's so, but it's okay. Like, in fact, I love it because, because you actually far exceeded me at the task I was hoping you could help me do, and I'm not critical. I'm actually really in awe of it. And I think it's really cool because it does show you how much, and I talk about this in the book, how much luck is involved, how much also like, like I've done great in furniture, but like you had something and I recognized it. I mean, that's why I, that's why I, you know, chose you, but like, it's cool to see that magnified. It's cool to see that play out. Cause I got to see the, well, not even the whole story, right? I got to learn about your 
pre-story way after you know you had long left the fold which oh my gosh so it was too much to unpack but let's start in the let's go back to the closet so so we met at, at an Aubon Pond in Stanford, Connecticut, because I had put an, an ad in right. Craigslist for just someone to help me with social media on the side. Yep. Probably paid you, you know, like nothing out of oh, my pocket. Great. To, great. to just like, to just help me. And so t- 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 tell a real short version of where that led and then where it went. So, okay. It's, it's so much to unpack. So I was doing just like dead end, like meaningless jobs. I think at the time when I saw the Craigslist ad, I was trying to like, get into penny trading stocks with my buddy Patsy. And I, I saw this ad and it was like, you know, needed social media, uh, you know, manager, brand relations, all this stuff. And I just started like Googling a bunch of like, you know, keywords, brand marketing, public relations, social media. Like, dude, I didn't know anything about the space, but I was, I you know, I've always been a finesser. Like that's always been my thing. And now I've learned how to use it for, for strategic good. But At the time, it was like, how can I find a way to get involved, right? And so I applied. I got the call back while I was at Subway one day. And we get on the phone, and you're like, yeah, so what do you know about, um, you know, brand awareness? And and what do you know about public relations? And I was like, dude, big brand awareness guy, public relations, (laughs) impressions, engagement. Like, dude, I just used every word under the sun. And I think we probably had a couple moments where we, like, connected and laughed on the call. And I think you you got like a slight sense of the fact that I was just like a good dude. Right. So you being like, obviously the, the just, I don't know, dude, you're just obviously like a morally awesome person. Just a great guy. You were like, all right, I, I I feel like his energy is good. Let me meet with him. So we meet up and I, dude, I just told this story yesterday on an A and E televised documentary. That's going to be coming out later this year. The story of meeting you. And I remember we met and you gave me the menu and, and, and I know we'll get into it, but I'm like maybe 10 years or no, I, I'm maybe a few years at the time, just out of drug addiction and had never really experienced anything, you know, I'd never had a, a great, you know, steak or any of that. And you handed me the menu and you said, order whatever you want. And I was like, what? I was like, what is this world that I'm, that I'm in right now? So anyways, you know, we sit there and we eat and we connect. And I think you just got to read for me, which was, I love this kid's energy. He's, he's obviously super passionate. He's obviously super well-spoken. He's definitely a little rough around the edges. He has no idea what the fuck he's doing. But I have no idea you're like a recovery. None of that. I didn't even find that out. By the way, I never asked, right? I, I didn't find that out till you were years outside of the company. You wrote the book. And then it's like, wow. And of course, like, it only gave me more respect, frankly, for what you, who you've become and what you've done. But yeah, no idea. So, so then you, so basically you give me this, this job as, um, trying to help you blow up your socials, managing your Twitter, managing your, your YouTube channel, your Instagram, and kind of like following you around and detailing the, the, the major events in your life. And Another thing, obviously you, you got a lot of time in my book in the fifth vital of talking about it. You introduced me to the state of California. I mean, I, I, where I, where I live now in, in a, a beautiful house in, in the Hills and, and you know, who knows, maybe never leave. Um, the first time I ever stepped foot in this state was with you. And I'll always remember that. I'll always remember that trip and that day and that opportunity. <laughs> and it's just so wild to, to sit here and, and, and recollect on it. But so I spent some time working with you and, you know, we, we, and somehow an opportunity arises for me to get more involved in the brand side at, at, at Lovesack in, in, in general. And by the way, let me interrupt. So I'm, I'm sitting here at Lovesack HQ now, Utah. We've got a few offices around, uh, hence all the Lovesack stuff behind me. And, but at the time we were operating out of this crappy office, <laughs> low rent, side of Stanford, Connecticut. Um, and, and nowhere even for Malak to sit. So we literally would meet cause Malak wasn't even really an employee in the beginning. He was sort of like my, just this guy that was helping me. And so we would literally meet in Dave's tool closet. Tool closet. We would literally hang out in there cause there's like nowhere else for us to vibe yeah. and like look yeah. at internet stuff and like plan our little strategies. Right. Yes. Yeah. We were in, and like, then of course, like the, in a closet, yeah. like actually, like, it's not like when people like coin it, like it was like a closet. We were actually like yeah. a actual, no windows, 
closet where there was just enough room to like tinker left and right just a little bit. That was it. Totally. <laughs> yeah. So my point, so, so all the love sack guys kind of obviously saw, I mean, we're around you and then they kind of like roped you in. It's like, Hey man, Sean's great, but like, we need help with the brand. We got no one to do this work. And, and you got pulled into the company doing love sack social media. Yeah. And of course, and so I think like right there, you have such a good example of, he goes from Googling buzzwords on about social media and PR and whatever to kind of doing it with me, but like what I'm his mentor, I'm your mentor. And you know, I don't know. It's weird. Cause you're helping me, but my crash course. And, and, and now, now you're, then you end up running it for a company that was already, you know, whatever, a $50 million company. Yep. And you're running the social media, not just running it, but, but now go to where, where it is. Where, where do you take it? Like brag a little bit. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah I will. So, so I, I just want to give some flowers out right off the bat. Like those guys, um, you know, are also very important to the story. I got a crash course in marketing from some of the greatest marketers yeah. that I've still ever met to this day. Pat Santangelo. They're still here at Love Sack. Listen, I mean. Doing what they do. Monsters, monsters. Pat Santangelo, Charlie Tubb, Eric. Alan at the time, I mean, I mean, the, the, the experience that I had with those guys was, was definitive in my life. And, and the things that I learned from those guys, I still use to this day. I just got off a call earlier today mm -hmm. where I used a lot of that same stuff, but, um, basically the idea was, okay, how do we plug this, this kid who, who obviously understands social media, obviously even more than that understands relationship building. You, you mm -hmm. put, you put him in a room around people that he should be a little not so confident being around, whether it's <laughs> Branson, Jay-Z, Beyonce, all the people that I was put in a room with through Love Sack, and that becomes his room. And that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so clearly he has something that we want to now utilize on the brand side. And so, you know, some and of the- By the way, people, in fairness, I think people liked you. Like these people that that- you know, frankly, don't even like me and, and I'm like the CEO guy or like the millionaire guy or the winner of the rebel billionaire, whatever. Like they just liked you. And I think there's something to that. Like that can't be ignored. Like, and it, it, you know, it's a, it's, it's a superpower. It is. It, it's my thing. And, and it's funny. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like, imagine the idea of making a career out of being likable, but, but <laughs> like, it, and, and I'm, and I'm abrasive. I say crazy yeah. shit, but, but, yeah. I, but my entire toolbox creates a person that it that is very real very authentic very relatable in in struggle in empathy and in a lot of things and i i i also the, the biggest you know rule i ever give out to people is i try always to to vibrate at a really high frequency and i and i think that energy that you give out if if you have the power to continuously give that energy out in all situations you will win in business. You will win in, in, in lovemaking. You will win in romance. You will win everywhere. If you are able to resonate at a frequency that allows people to go from where they may be in the moment to a higher level. And so if you're able to go in every situation with a smile, every situation with a compliment, every situation with a, with a good attitude, you are levels above a lot of the competitors, especially in today's day and age who are sad, who are, ready to fight or co be combative or pull others down. If you can break the mold and find it within yourself to be resonating at that frequency, you have a much higher chance of winning in my, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and I think I I'm guessing, I don't know. You didn't know that when you were busy resonating with the people we threw you out at like, Hey, see if you can get this dude to mess with us. Hey, see if you can make this connection. Hey, go to, go to London and get Unilad to, you know, work with us on something viral. You probably didn't think about it in, in the terms you just, you, that I'm guessing that came later as you've reflected on why you've been able to do the things that you've done. Right. But, for, for but sure. you were doing it, but you were doing it. And so I think like that in a lot of ways, I think helped you do that next thing. You know, you had the capacity to, to just be, you had some natural capacity. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I always just looked at it as just, as just being, at the time, you know, like, it's not like, that's just always how yeah. it was. I was always that kind of hyperactive, to be honest, like high energy person, but, but 
you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I also have a very analytic mind. I've, I was, you know, I was in the gifted program my entire life. I'm obviously yeah, you're not dumb. Right. It's easy right, for you right. to play dumb on TVs. I do. I do. But you're not dumb. And I knew that by the way, like I, I always knew that about, and I've, you know, I, I, cause you can't kid a kidder. Like I play like the dumb beanbag boy on TV sometimes, you know, but in right. fairness, like there, you know, there's a, there's a power in it because it disarms people, right? hundred percent. Nobody, nobody, it's, it's much harder to relate to Einstein than it is to, to, you know, your next door neighbor. Like, and, and, and I thrive on relatability. I thrive on people. My, my, the, the output of my delivering that energy, the, the immediate product of that is I have a very uncanny ability to build rapport within moments. And that is, that is, that is the real product byproduct of what I do and how I operate. And so that means that when two days ago I sit down with Kevin Hart, who is potentially the biggest celebrity on the planet to have a, a, an hour and a half conversation with him on a couch within 30 seconds, he's never heard of my name. He's never met me. He's never seen me, but within 30 seconds, I can command eye contact from him and a, in an equal, uh, respect and a quality of respect within 30 seconds. I mean, it's, it's, it's a quick joke. It's a quick rapport builder. It's a quick trade off of respect between, between two beings. And that ability to build rapport is, is, is everything in my life. And that's, that's what I, that's yeah. what I pride myself on, but there was more to but it. In, fa in fairness, in fairness, I think it's, uh, it's observable in the output, right? I, I never became you know, even though I hired people to help me become some kind of, you know, have, and I look, I have some kind of social media footprint, but sure. no, nothing like what you've built. Right. So even though I've, I've had a, a bit of a machine around me to try and help make that happen. Cause look, it's part of business these days. It just shows like I have strengths that probably you don't, and you have strengths that I don't. But if you're able to channel, if you're able to identify those strengths that you've done now, as you've reflected and you've identified what they are now consciously, like before you were just following your instincts and there's nothing wrong with that. They led you to the right places. But as you've been able to identify what those strengths are and then, and then even lean into them further and channel them toward things that are more productive than let's say buying or selling drugs. And, and I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure. not even trying to be yeah. a jerk. What I mean by that is like, you always have those strengths. Yeah. You finally just found a place where they, where it pays way better. And right, you used to yeah. bug me. Yeah. You used to say to me like, man, how do I, what can I do though? Like, cause you see like, let's ask doing 50 million in sales. You know, I get this dumb salary. Like how could I, cause you knew that you had strength and I, and what did I tell you? Do you remember at those times? Do you ever remember? Like what did I, cause I wanted you, cause I needed you to stick around and like help me still, but I couldn't, you know, you, you essentially wanted a raise, but essentially I, I, I the, the majority of the time whenever I had doubts with you, it was, and this may not be the exact thing, but it was always that if I kept doing what I was doing, that the money was going to come. Oh, you, 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 that's what it was. That's exactly what it was. You said it was specifically, I said, because I knew who you were, like I can look in your face. I knew from the first time we sat down and I knew you had. I don't know what it was exactly, but you know, I hired you like, I mean, you know, I didn't hire someone else. And, and I, I said to you, Mike, I said, like, if you just keep doing this, I know like we don't pay a ton, whatever. And you're seeing all these rich people around you and you're, you're messing with celebrities and it's like, you got your dumb little salary and you're doing your expense report for like the rental car gas, whatever, helping me cram a love sack into the back seat Cause we can't afford shipping. Right. Yep. But, but I said like, this would lead you to places that, that you can't get to on your own. And, and, sh and, and it ultimately who would have guessed it was Logan Paul and, and all, that whole freight train that it led you to, I, I wouldn't have guessed that. I, I wouldn't have guessed it the day. I mean, we're hanging out in park city. I wouldn't have known that that's where it would go. Yeah. You told right? me, but you it did. Me. And you, but you jumped on it and you, when you did, I didn't stop you. But more importantly, you didn't hang back. You went for it. Yeah. You told me, you told me that whenever we'd go in rooms, you would always tell me that the true value 
of my experience at Lovesack would not be my salary, would not be my benefits, would not be 401k. It would be my Rolodex. You used to tell me that all the time. You said the relationships that you walk out of this with will get you the byproducts that you're looking for. And it's so insane to have this conversation now and to realize that you were 100%. You had so much insight and foresight to know that that's the new was going to come true. And I knew I wouldn't hang on to you, but, but, but here's the thing. I don't, I don't take any credit for it because this is the key to this whole topic. Do the next thing. You still have to have the guts to when that jumping off point comes to, to recognize it, to lean into it, to manage this relationship. So you don't burn your day job immediately. Cause you know, you need the day job to get you to park city into the next little tryst with Logan Paul or whatever, you know? Yep. And it, and make the leap out of the secure job to probably something that pays nothing necessarily on day one and take a risk on your own brand and all that other stuff. And so, but so you took that risk and I, and I applaud you for it because it's just as easy to not do the next thing and stay with the good job or stay with the stable, whatever, or the, or the easy relationship that's comfortable. And I know I'm not, whatever, but at least we can watch movies together, whatever it is, personal or professional, you had the savvy to recognize it, lean into it and then go for it. Yep. And I was sad cause I lost you, but I'm ha- I'm, I couldn't be happier for you. You know, I, I'll dude, I'll always remember those, those days. And, and it, it's funny cause I, 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 once again, wrote about this in the book there was a major, you know, impasse. There was a moment where I had maneuvered or, you know, and, 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 and people watching from the outside, I I hate to even have to voice like this, but the simplicity that which people think these things happen, you, you know, this, like, like every entrepreneur, business person or successful you know, person watching this knows exactly what I'm talking about, but the simplicity in which th- people think these things happen is, is, is yeah. almost frustrating for, for the person. It's not like, it's not like you fell out of a car door, landed in Logan Paul's feet, and then he picked you up, dusted you off and you were best friends. And it's not to say that it was manufactured either. Like, like, Oh, you sought out Logan Paul and became his friend so that you could like hang on his coattails. It's not that either. When I, when I, it's authentic. It's, it was very authentic, but what I'm getting at is in, in late 2017, um, I am managing a very blossoming career at Lovesack. I have just secured the, the number one most viral branded video of all time. uh, All time. All time, 43 million views within 24 hours on Facebook. At the time, this was, it was unheard of. And we did it for $0. You know, we, we were crushing it. We were securing relationships with every creator. I had a 401k. I just bought an apartment. I had a, a you know, stock ownership in a company that was promised to go public. We were, we were going crazy. And this relationship with Logan starts to blossom. And I, I start appearing in his content, just having fun, going to California, Sometimes on Love Sacks Dime to do branded stuff out there while also just being in his content and having a good time. And by the time January 1st happens, 2018, you know, the greatest scandal in, you know, or, or, or whatever you want to call it in internet history occurs. And, and you know, the, the great uh, Tokyo incident of, you know, to, of January 1st, 2018. And, and Logan is essentially wiped off the face of the earth. And, you know, everything that he had been and all of the promise that may have been seen was, was temporarily unplugged. He was canceled. In those days, he was was canceled before canceling was a thing. Fully canceled. Like not like partially canceled. Like he was, he was done. It was, it was wrapped up. It was over like head back to Ohio and go back to doing whatever you did before social media was over. And so I, I think people like, you know, have this assumption that like, I, you know, met Logan and and everything was so sweet. And we started doing videos together and I was like, Oh my God, like I'm going to become famous. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? But like, you know, at the time in, in, in mid 2018, I got tasked with 
helping Logan rebuild a broken system. And that means his social media footprint. That means his PR. That means rebuilding his team into a group of people that were able to review a product before it went out to 50 million people and, and got him canceled. And, and putting some level of infrastructure around some uh, 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 22 year old at mm -hmm. the time who was bringing in as much money as the furniture brand I was working for. Yeah. Insane. 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 So, so like I'm balancing these two factories at the same time. I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of work at Love Sack after, you know, setting up a, a, a multi hundred thousand dollar gig with Jay-Z and Beyonce in Philadelphia for Made in America Festival. And then I'm flying two days later to LA to sit with manager Jeff and say, yo, these people need off the team. We need to restructure, you know, the, the agreement that we have with Logan's legal team. They're getting too much money. We need to get a better relationship with YouTube and find out how they're going to help us avoid this type of stuff in the future. So I'm managing these two completely violently different pursuits. And it, what it eventually led to was, to be honest, the highest levels of success in both places mm. to eventually where I got, you know, an offer from Logan, which was dude, like, I need you. I, we need you over on this side mm. and here's what we're willing to give to you. So mm. I, I guess like, I guess like the, the lesson there is number one, always don't quit your day job. Like, as you said <laughs> earlier, like I was, well, no, you quit the day job, but don't quit it too soon. <laughs> exactly. Sorry. Until by the way, sir, yeah, I, I want, I want to hear, but I have to comment on this. I met a woman just the other day who was shooting me for a magazine cover who was like, Sean, we met, we met 25 years ago when you were waiting tables at Shaoli. And my point is I was waiting tables. People don't know this. I was waiting tables. I was literally a waiter, you know, in at the nights while in the days I was building that first factory. I mean, I was literally over there building it. And I didn't quit until the day we started stuffing sacks in the, for the big $12,000 order. So just the same, that day job or night job in my case lasted until midnight. Let, you know, let, and, I, and so I, I was, you know, not smart enough, but I was lucky enough to even be able to carry the day job to the secondary stream because you yeah. guys were so gracious. And I think also just, you know, uh, it, it was ba that was basically like my the thanks that I got, which was yo you you crushed it, bro. Now go spread your wings. Take we, by had, the way, we had almost half a million on Instagram by then, uh, half, coming from nothing. We you know were messing with some of the biggest celebrity. I mean, you had left a, a really fantastic foundation for us, and of course, you know, sad to see you go. But but that you were that's what I'm saying. I feel like you lived the just do the next thing uh, lifestyle. Mon right. yeah, mantra for sure, for sure. And, and, and that, and that moment came where it was, yo, listen, Mike, I want you over here. I'm offering you this amount of money. I'm offering you this thing. And I'm, and I'm standing in the middle and I'm looking at love sack and I'm looking at my life there, by the way, my family and all these things. And I'm looking at the other thing and I'm, and I'm looking at the potential there. And you know, the, the do the next thing is, is equally unsimple and uneasy as mm -hmm. what I described earlier in, in, in how hard it is to find the first stream of success, right? There's so many factors that entrepreneurs don't talk about when they talk about making a transition into a new revenue stream or new you know, business. Maybe they do, some of them, but dude, when you're about to leave a, a, a blossoming career that has a steady paycheck for a canceled YouTuber, <laughs> in, in, a, in, a, in a state all the way across the country yeah. on a pursuit of God knows what, you don't even know what. And by the way, saying goodbye to the mother that stood next to you through the most traumatic periods of your life, her life, and anybody's life, and the sisters, and, and Sean who gave you a chance, and, and all of this that you've built, and saying, I'm going to move all the way across the country and take this massive risk was not easy for me. It wasn't easy for me to do that. And I, and I, and I think like, that's, that's the lesson. I think I remember thinking to myself at the time, 
I don't feel perfect about this. I don't mm -hmm. feel per, and I was saying it to my mom. I don't feel perfect about this. It does it like, like it's one thing when you get another job across the country and it's X mm -hmm. amount of dollars and you've got the housing set up and all that stuff. But this wasn't the case. There was no, mm -hmm. you know, two year guarantee. There was no signing bonus. And I remember talking to my mom and, and just saying like, I, I, I really don't know what to do. And, and, and it, at the end of the day, it all just comes down to your intuition and your ability to, to, to collectively gather the, the factors from both sides and say, and, and, and there's always, there's always gotta be a little bit of chance. There's always okay. gotta be a little bit yeah. of risk. And so if oh. you're an entrepreneur who's watching this saying to yourself like, oh, I'll know, I'll know for sure. It'll be like turning yeah. on a light switch. That's probably not going to be the case. There's probably always going to be a little percentage of potential failure that you're going to have to overcome and you're going to have to take oh, the I leap. I love it. You, na you nailed it. Let me, let me share two little anecdotes that'll bridge perfectly to what you just said. So that, so, so, uh, so, uh, an addendum that, that woman who said, I met you while you were waiting tables. She remembers because she like she liked me. Like I was kind of like a fun flirty waiter, whatever, you know, like that's who I was. Right. And she liked me so much. She got me an interview for her company, which was a big multinational company. And I interviewed for their head of Asia position. I'm, I'm fluent in Mandarin Chinese. I'm just graduating from university. I got this dumb beanbag company dragging me down like a ball and chain that just got this big order. But like, I still am terrified of it because like it, that, you know, that's one that's door a door B was this like, international job with her company because she got me this interview and and they were going to offer it to me a 20 a 22 year old kid and what's my point my point is is um i ended up she told me i you didn't anyway it's i i obviously chose door number a i i i was interviewing for jobs besides the waiter thing i was interviewing for proper jobs even while i'm building this factory at love sack secondly i had the same moment with my mom where one day i was cutting out sacks in my basement like on my hand, on my, on the floor of my parents' basement. And she walked by looking at me like, Hey, you know, this is a few years before, like, you know, you, you're an honor student, you speak Chinese, you, you have all these other opportunities. She looked at me cutting out stuff. She wasn't critical. She just said like, do, is this what you want to do? You know, she's looking at me cut out figure eights with scissors. And I, I really thought about it for a second. I looked at her and actually I mentioned this in the book too, but I look at her and I said, um, I don't know. I just feel like I should. And I'm guessing that's how you felt moving a to California. Percent. A thousand percent. Like, and, and, and that's, and that's what it came down to, because I think in life, especially when you find some level of success, you also find a lot of power in saying no to stuff. And, and, and it, and it becomes almost programmed in you to, to say like, nah, 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 nah. I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, sorry. Hold on a sec. Um, I got to turn my notifications off. You almost get like programmed to, to let me, let me make sure that doesn't happen again. Sorry. Hang on. Uh, do not disturb on. Okay. Yeah. You almost, you, you almost get programmed to, to protecting your energy. And, and, and by the way, like that's another, you know, way that you have to be to, to stay focused on an individual goal. You almost have to put blinders on. Yeah. So it's do and, the next thing, not do everything. A hundred percent. And that, and that's, and you just said it perfectly. It comes down to being able to decipher exactly what the next thing is. There will be a okay. million things. Well, that that's my question. Yourself. That's my yeah. question. Like, how do you decipher? And by the way, we've talked about big things like changing a career, but now let's go more, let's go smaller. Like, you know, you all of a sudden are sort of managing or whatever, help rebuilding Logan's brand. It's sophisticated. It's a multi-million dollar brand. There's lots of tentacles out there. You got hangers on, you got attorneys, you got people charging money. You don't know that much about big business. How do you know what to do next at the micro level? You know, like, how do you know what to do next? How do you navigate? So, uh, so obviously, and, and it's crazy to say, but I was originally hired by Logan, salary position, to in a way execute some of the stuff, dude, this is, this is crazy. This is crazy because of the nimbleness and 
you know, family culture that Love Sack existed as at the time, and I'm sure now publicly traded, so on and so forth, it's, it's, uh, it's dramatically different. I got the opportunity to learn about verticals that had nothing to do with brand marketing. Dude, I was sitting, do you remember the Omnichannel meeting? Do you yeah. remember the meeting when we would sit down and, and um, uh, Kylie would pull together this Omnichannel brief, right? And I would sit there and I would listen to Doreen talk about legal stuff. And I would, and so I, I, I think being a sponge and being able to absorb obviously is a really important thing in life, right? And, and, and being curious about business is multifaceted. And I always paid attention to everything. And so when I went to Logan's side, I had a basic understanding of a lot of stuff that I probably shouldn't have, to be mm -hmm. completely honest with you. From spending time with you, from spending time mm -hmm. with Jack, spending time with Doreen and listening and paying attention to mm -hmm. stuff that necessarily didn't impact my career, my job. So you had, so, so you had prepared even unknowingly to do some of those next things by actually paying attention. You know what I'm saying? Like you didn't just show up and do your job and go home and like those other fools are doing what they're doing. But, but just by being present in, in the opportunities afforded you, you had a, even unknowingly, had prepared yourself to kind of do some of those next things once you if were faced you, with them. If you think your next thing is simply going to involve the toolkit that you're working with today, you're, you're making a massive mistake. You yeah. have no idea what your next thing is going to be. <laughs> so if you are, if you are granted the blessing and opportunity to be around people like Jack or Sean Nelson or, or anybody, People, if, if you are around people who are greater than you in any vertical and you're not taking advantage of that opportunity by observing and paying attention, you're making a mistake that will keep you rooted in your current thing. You will not have the opportunity to expand to the next. And yeah. so I, 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 well at Lovesack, I tried to absorb as much as I could to get at least semi-proficient in business as a holistic topic. You know, I, I was not, I didn't go to college, dude. I didn't, I, I, I went to community college for liberal arts as a joke, but I'm not, I don't have an MBA, but I guarantee you, I have more business experience than 95% of the MBAs out there yeah. because I paid I attention and I, and I, and I dived in and, and, and I, and I'll say this too, backing up, building out your toolkit by way of having the opportunity to sit with people and, and observe them can only happen if you're passionate about what you're doing. If you do not feel passionate about your current pursuit, honestly, and, 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 it, and, it's, and it's, it's too much of a luxury to, to be able to say this because I'm still so empathetic to people that have to stay in their current pursuit because they have factors that require them to do so. Right. You're just, you're just, there's no excuse for you to not be looking elsewhere. It, passion is everything. If you cannot claim to feel passionate about what you are currently doing or have a route in your mind on how you plan on getting passionate about the next thing or the current thing, you need to dramatically rethink your, your pursuit. Life or, or, or career or, or a pursuit of success without passion for that. And that means a, a desire to really want to win at what you're doing is a exercise in futility. There's there, yeah. it, it is, it is a, it is a waste of your blessing of being on this earth. Yeah. I really and, mean that. And that, and I know that's a privileged statement. I know there's a lot of people out there who are working their asses off because they have a family to, to, to take care of and they have to pay for insurance and they have, I've been there. Trust me. I have been there. And I, and I remember the mundaneness and the sadness of doing that. And I, and I also should stand as a, as a testament to those people that there is other stuff out there. I am no special yeah. person. I'm a felon from Connecticut with no <laughs> college degree and no, no, you know, insane starting thing. I had, I, I was a 400 credit score when I met you, Sean, I was living with wow. my grandfather who was dying of cancer. Wow. Like there was no special thing there, you know? So be, you know, obviously I have these innate talents, but like anybody watching this right now should be thinking about what they can do that they love to do.
because that is what is going to give you the fuel you need to then obser- observe the people you're around and then create a toolkit to do the next thing. Yeah. But the well, root fairness, is the passion. Observer of, of you. Uh, I don't think, I'm guessing, even, even probably when you were at Lovesack, even after a few years of Lovesack, I don't, I'm guessing you may have never become super passionate about furniture design or about, you know, modular solutions. I don't know, maybe, but, but you at least probably became passionate about the whole, you know, PR, social media, exposure, marketing game. And my, and, and when I, and when I first met you, I, like you said, you admitted you had to Google some of the words just to hang in the room. And, and I watched you, for instance, naturally gravitate toward like posting about the burgers you would eat now that you could afford expensive burgers on love sack salary. <laughs> and no, but seriously, right. Based on everything you already yeah. said in this interview and, and now even that's become a next thing for you. Like you're, you know, just like there's uh, you know, barstool sports guy doing pizza. You got, Hey, big Mike doing burgers. And I yep. see it. And I think it's so cool because sometimes the next thing isn't necessarily the next thing. It's a next thing. And you're spinning six plates and now you're like the burger guy. And I watched that evolve. And so like, you don't have to be passionate about modular furniture just because you're working at a modular furniture company, but you could find something to be passionate about to your yes. point. Yes, you, you certainly hit the nail on the head there. And that means if you are somewhere, if you are at a business that you have to stay at or that you even want to stay at because it's a successful business, find a vertical of that business that, that ignites you. I mean, I mean, if you, if, and get there and go get there, like really go get there. Like if you, because you're not, we are, we are continuing to move to a day and age where you can attain things without the traditional prerequisites that were once requirements, right? And, and that means great news, dude. College is being kind of pushed to the side. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of big tech companies now that aren't requiring a bachelor's degree to apply yeah. for, for, for working with them, which is incredible. So they might so the even big, hire you if you're a felon, you never know. Bro, look at that, dude. Look at that. Right. And that was a you whole would never be hired at love sack today. Correct. So I'm glad correct. you made, I'm glad you made it when you did. <laughs> correct. I know. I know. And that was just and it's another, not, by the way, it's not because you're not the same person, man. I freaking love you. And I'm, I'm so proud of you. And, and I wish the world wasn't so, you know, but it's becoming less so to your point. Well, well, right. listen, I mean, listen, there, there, there certainly, uh, there certainly should be parameters around, you know, <laughs> certain, certain things, right? Like, like if you're getting a job as a police officer, it makes sense to not be a, a, a drug dealer, right? Like, so I get that. And I would have held it. I wouldn't have held it against anyone at the company if that were the way that it went. But, you know, I think the reason why that ended up working out is because, I had already been working there for so long. And, and I, I remember that conversation so, so well, um, because that was a really tough moment for me. I had been working for you for a long time and you know, for a decent amount of time and had started to unofficially work for the brand and make some big moves there. And I remember getting some real traction. And I, I think I was even a part of some articles online. And, and, and like yeah. I said, being me just a few years out of the hor- horror that I had lived in and, and, and the things that I had seen, finally seeing a potential route out and seeing a potential mm-hmm. for a life that I, I, I had only mm-hmm. dreamed of, right? And I, I remember, you know, I think it was Charlie saying like, we're gonna make you an official offer. Uh, to be a part of the brand and, and, and no one knew the, the, the real backstory. No one knew. I, I, I never knew. I never it, knew until I read your book years after you had left. And I purposely never really asked, you know, but, but also like, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I knew, I knew like that when this official offer came across the table that one of the aspects of that offer was going to probably be a contingency on a background check and, and, and a criminal and a criminal check. And I, 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 I'm trying to think of who exactly it was. Maybe I shouldn't say actually, but I sat down with one of the, the members of the team and having, you know, had all this success. And I was, I was so scared 
that I think as, as, as an addict and as someone who had, had seen so much, you know, trauma and, and just terrible stuff, a lot of times, even, even now, to be completely honest with you, I'm waiting for a reset. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, like for someone right. to say, Hey man, that was all, a, that was all a joke. Like, what are you stupid? Like you thought you were going to have a $4 million house and no, like that's ours. Like you, this is not for you. And when I got that official offer, um, I, I remember sitting down with somebody and saying, Hey, like I have to come clean to you about something like I'm, I'm not going to be able to pass, pass this, this background check. And, and, mm-hmm. um, you know, like this brand is, is my life, dude. Like, like you, you know, that I was living for it a hundred percent. I was fully yeah. invested and I, 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 I I promise you, like, I'm not going to mess up. Like, like this is a, this is my past. Like this was years and years and years ago. I'm, I'm changed. And you know, however it got done, like it got done. And, and, and mm-hmm. obviously years before public offering and a lot of the other stringent <laughs> you know, guidelines, but I'll always be, I'll always be, you know, indebted to, to you, to, you know, the rest of the team that was there at the time and, and, and people who were willing to, say everyone in this world deserves a second chance and everyone deserves a, a, a chance at redemption and to, to make things right because mm-hmm. there's a lot of people out there who are suffering and there's a lot of people out there who have done some things that they're not proud of and some things that they regret deeply out of desperation, out of, you know, mental illness, uh, this substance abuse, whatever. And, and, you know, out of all the things we talk about today, I hope that, you know, my main story, my legacy will always be that, that people deserve second chances and that, you know, people who, can look so down and out and so devastated in their life can come up and, and, and create real impact and real greatness and, and be better and greater than, than they could have ever imagined. And so, um, you know, you guys certainly allowed that to happen and, and were, wow. you know, a part of that. So I'll always be appreciative of that. No, that's, that's beautiful. And it's, uh, I appreciate you sharing. I appreciate you being so vulnerable. I mean, obviously it's, that's also one of your strengths. I think that's a, that's a, that's a strength anyone can choose to have is, you know, I, I, I've, I've tried to be, I try to be in the book that's coming, you know, uh, let me save you 25 years that this podcast, I try and be very real about all these mistakes I've made and, 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 and I'm, I'm not always great at it, but I think like vulnerability is, is a choice. And I've been really proud to see you choose to be so vulnerable with really, really tough stuff to really share. If you, if you haven't come across Mike's book, the fifth vital. I mean, it's a book. And, and you always told me, man, because I was telling you about my book and I'm finally getting mine years after your, you beat me to it. And you're like, wait till you read mine. And I'm like, whatever, man. <laughs> you know, I didn't know. I never asked. And I purposely kind of didn't. But now, I mean, you were right, man. I got to tell you, man, you were right. Like you had a story for sure. And, but more importantly, you dared to tell it. I, I'm sure there's many stories like yours, but not everyone dares to tell it. Like it is it's very I mean, scary. It's-, it's scary. And it's, and it's, and it's painful to be honest with you. It's still, I mean, I, I did this A and E doc yesterday and had a couple moments where I had to, had to step off because, um, it's, it's, you know, the, the story of addiction is, is, uh, and mental illness, you know, as well is, is just such a, it's just such a dark place, you know, and yeah. such a lonely place. And I, and, and, I, one of the, one of my, my, my favorite part of my book and put, probably I would say if I write a second book or a third book, the most important writing that I've ever done and will ever do in my life was contained in the last uh, four pages of that book, which were the letters that I wrote to people struggling or more importantly, the letters I wrote to people who loved someone struggling. And it's one thing to be in that world and to be a homeless person living on the streets of Los Angeles and dealing with schizophrenia and, and having no resources. It's one thing to be a person who's been addicted to Oxycontin or methadone for seven years and, and, and struggling through that every day. But it's, a, it's, it's another thing to be a family member of one of those people or a friend mm. uh, or a caregiver. And 
you know, you look at the size of this opiate epidemic and it, you have to exponentialize it based on the amount of lives touched by those mm. addicted, right? And like, I mean, I, I had this moment where I really, really couldn't get it back together yesterday when I was talking about the idea of birthing a, a child and, and watching that child grow from a seed and, and devoting your entire life to this, to this kid, everything, your whole being, you, you know what it's like mm -hmm. to be a parent. Every, every part of you is, is invested into that. It, it is you, it's a, it is a mirror of you in ways. And to watch that person then fall into something that you can't help them with. Yeah. And that is a, that is a really, really, uh, tragic reality that is very prevalent right now. And, and I still have a lot of tough, uh, a lot, it's very tough for me to talk about because I have to imagine what it was like for my family to, to yeah. watch that. So, so, um, the last three pages of my book, three or four pages of my book are very, very important to me. The, there's a chapter called afterthoughts that saw no editing. It saw no proofreading, no line editing, no beta reading. I said, this chapter will remain untouched. I do not want anyone to, to mess with it in any way. And it's mm -hmm. probably the most important writing that I'll ever do for the rest of my life. And mm -hmm. so the book was, I mean, in a lot of ways, the book was the next thing, you know, like I, mm -hmm. I, I, I it, it, you know, it's funny because we're threading this through line today, Sean, of. A lot of times, th this I hope is the most important thing taken from today. A lot of times the next thing is not always next. It's happening right now as well. Hmm. I, I really do, do believe that and mean that because while I was working at Love Sack, while I was building the relationship with, with Logan, I was writing that book. I remember, and, yeah. And, 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 and parallel pathing in life as much as that sounds insane to an act, yeah. to a person, the idea of working on, on things while also maintaining the sanctity and integrity of each of those products and giving each one of those your all is, yeah. is important, you know? So a and lot of times right. the next thing is right now. Well, and, and you, you were writing the book and I didn't know what it was and I never pressed, but like, uh, and I was skeptical, you know, whatever. I don't know what your, your book's going to be. You always said, yeah, I have this book. I have a story. And I was like, well, I have a story. I have a love sack story, you know? I mean, well, you didn't say, but you never said that, but yeah. But no, but, but uh, <clears throat> my point is, I'm sure you, as you were writing it back then and, and your career was growing, you know, I'm sure you were hoping that you could somehow write a book and it would become a bestseller and be successful and make you money or, or, or just help other people or whatever, you know, I'm, but really in reality, my guess is you were probably writing that book too. Cause you kind of had to, you had, you had stuff you wanted to express. You're an expressive person. You, you had to write the book, but how could you have really known that you would also make decisions that would put you in a position to not only write a book, but to, but to platform a book in a way that it could become a bestseller and, and not just make you money, of course, but like really reach people. And your book is, one of the, your book is a very unique book. Your book has reached a lot of people. I hear about it, man. They, they DM me too I know. because of your book. And they're like, they Hey man, about just, they just read wanted about to say, you know, really glad, you know, really happy to see what happened with Mike or glad, you know, glad you were able to play a role. And, and I remember getting a flood of those when your book published it, you know, shortly after. And I, and I, and I was like, what, you know, what's happening. And, uh, but you, you know, like, you're right. The next thing might be happening now, but you also have to be intuitive enough and open enough to your intuition, even if it doesn't seem possible to, to, to do the work of putting the words on pages. Cause you might just be in a position to have a bestseller when it finally comes time to get the thing printed. Isn't that insane? And it's, and it's, it's also like, once again, back to passion. I mean, one of the reasons why I wrote the fifth vital is because I, it's, it's crazy. I have one of the biggest podcasts on the planet, one of the most viewed YouTube cha channels on the planet, which is crazy, you know, well, easy on the YouTube channel. I'm not Mr. Beast. Right. But like I, I have a heavily viewed YouTube channel, <laughs> but yeah. the, the, the ironic factor and, and, and situation is I'm actually a stronger writer than any of those things. 
I mean, my writing, yeah. I, I wrote that book. That was, there was no ghostwriter. There was, yeah. there was a, 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 a strategic editor who then moved some stuff yeah. around, but like I wrote that book. That mm -hmm. is my writing. And so, and so what I, what I, what I mean by that is it once again, boils down to passion mm -hmm. and, 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 and passion could be bifold. Passion can start as something that you know you love, but you're not very good at. And passion can also be, I'm passionate about something because I'm no, I know I'm damn good at it. And now I'm, you know what? I'm going to get passionate about it because this is how I win. And I'm going to so, do it even if it's not my day job. And even if it doesn't make me money, I'm going to do it anyway. Correct. Correct. And, and I know, you know, it's funny because obviously we've had so much weird overlap. Like our, our story <laughs> is so strange, dude. Like I, I'll go to Gary V now, like even the Gary V angle of it and like, you know, to you guys that had a relationship obviously in the past and go to, went to the Jets games and I would always, we would always run into Gary and now fast forward years and I'm always on podcasts with them and we have been, yeah. you know, this talk and that talk and it's all this stuff. Right. But I think, I think Gary was one of the first people who coined the idea of success landing somewhere between uh, what you're passionate about and what you're good at. And, mm -hmm. and, and honestly, I, I really believe that tenant. I think that that's a very important thing because I, dude, I love, I love skiing. <laughs> I, I, you know that. Yeah. I love skiing. I will never, I promise you, I will never be a competitive skier. Sean, I know that for a fact, <laughs> for a right. fact. Okay. So, so, but the, 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 the. To, to, to quickly go back to your first tenant, to your, to your very first thing, which is just try something. Just do something. That, that, just do something. That is my, also a very big rule for me because, you know, some of the things that I delivered to you in my first interview was wedding photographer, drone <laughs> cinematographer. Yeah. And, and I'm sure, you, you know, I, I've, I've had some talks on stages about this where I, I, I like taking pictures. I l always love taking pictures. And when, yeah. and when I got a few bucks from, you know, uh, writing for AOL, I bought this crappy, well, it's not crappy. I guess a Canon A7. I bought this, it, this can this camera, uh, a I don't even remember what it was, a Canon camera. I started taking yeah. photos with it and I was at the, at the, you know, beach taking photos and somebody came up to me and they were like, yo, do you do wedding photography? And I said, of course I do wedding yes. photography. Yes, of course By I do wedding way, photography. Where do I, who do I talk to about a franchise for Love Sack? Oh, funny you should ask. What, you know, what location are you in? Exactly. Our only one. Exactly. That and has this, to be the answer. Yes, yes. And this is before I even met you, but you had already schooled everybody on it. And yes, of course I shoot wedding photography. So I, so, you know, oh, well, how much does it cost? What's your budget? You know what I'm saying? Like, just flip it back on them. Right? Do flip the next back. thing. Exactly. So then, so then I, I, I shot a couple weddings and these photos were terrible, but their budget was, you know, 500 bucks. They weren't going to pay $20,000 for a wedding photographer. They captured the moment they paid the money, whatever. So I do a couple of these weddings and all of a sudden this company called DJI releases this drone. And so I buy this DJ, DJI phantom drone and I start flying it around at the duck pond and at the field. And one day this girl comes up to me and she goes, I shit you not. She goes, do you think that you could fly one of those things over a wedding? And I said, absolutely. I said, I am the foremost aerial cinematographer yes. in Connecticut. Hold on. Uh, so we saw you at the show. We want to order 12,000, you know, sacks. Oh yeah. No problem. We are the best not beanbag company in the world. It's me and Dave and a wood chipper, bro. Me and Dave and a wood chipper. We are the best not beanbag company in the world. It was kind of true. We might've been the only, yes, man, you get yes, it. You know, exactly. Exactly. And, and, and then before you know it, those two hobbies became financial revenue streams, which then also became tools in a toolbox that I delivered to you when I told yeah. you about brand marketing you and filmed, awareness. You filmed my uh, ALS bucket challenge with your drone <laughs> for social media that got at least 16 views, you know, for my but, uh, but channel. But basically what I'm getting at is like always, 
if, if something tickles you in life, it, nowadays more than ever before, and, you're, and, and this is almost like something that's just everybody knows now. I feel like I'm not even explaining anything. If you find a hobby, there's a good chance that you could monetize that hobby in the future. So if you see something that tickles you and you think it may, especially if it seems like something that may have a, a point of use in a brand or anywhere, go yes. do it, dude. Just go do something. Go, do go fly the drone. Go take yes. pictures of stuff. Get a wood chipper. You know? Yeah, man. I freaking love it, man. I, I, uh, I mean, that's the thing is, and, and that's the reason I want to, to do this podcast this way is because I believe that, listen, whether you're an influencer on the surface, whether you're, uh, an inventor, a business operator, whether you're, you know, an, a creative person in this day and age, successful people are all business people. Successful people all have these same kinds of instincts these shaunisms, I call them shaunisms, but they're just truths of the universe I've chosen to put into words. And I, I, so I love hearing your stories because you know them all, man. That's why I'm, I'm excited for you to read the book. In the spirit of the book, let me save you 25 years, Mike. Last question. Any one piece of advice you might give someone who's, 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 who's young to save them 25 years or, or maybe shave a decade off somewhere in there? Man, I, 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 it has to be, um, I, I feel like it's, it's, if it's worth hearing, I think we covered a lot of stuff today. I really, yeah. I really mean that. So I, I guess, I guess I what it would be is understand the value of relationships and, and, and understand that how you treat someone today may really influence how they treat you uh, uh, 10 years later. And, and, and you and never so, know who those someones will become. I have to say, I have to say this before we go. And, 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 and this is such a just, it's so great talking to you because, because so much of this stuff is real with us. Like yeah. so much of this stuff is real with us. And, and I, I don't usually, I'm not usually so giddy on podcasts anymore because I've done so many. Yeah. But, but like, it, this is just so great because I want to say this, you treated me the day I met you the same way that you treat me right now. And, and, and that is such a special thing to be able to say about, about yourself. You, you, you were as respectful of me, as kind to me, as hopeful for me the day you met me knowing nothing about me as you are today. And, 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 you know, would I have done the podcast anyways, you know, or, or, or helped you whenever you asked me anyways, of course, but, but I could never ever say no to you ever because of how, how incredible of a person you are, man. And I, I, I really mean that. And I'll, I'll be appreciative of you for the rest of my life, dude. Wow. Sorry to, sorry to, sorry to hit you with that last minute, bro. I'm sorry, bro. But you, you are, you're an incredible person, man. I really no, mean that. I think, I think everybody around you knows that, dude. So, look, man, we could talk for hours in respect of your time. Um, you know, want to wrap things up. But uh, I thought that, you know, in thinking, in, in kind of thinking through this topic and looking back at my, my own little manuscript. So the manuscript for the book is so short. I, it's crazy, man. I purposely wrote it. Like th this chapter is less than a page. It's three little paragraphs. And that's how the book works is I purposely, you know, you know me, I could have written and it, I started, I wrote yeah. the, I got a hundred pages into what would have become a 900 page book. And I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> so I, so I pared it way down. So I, I just want to read like one and a half sentences from that chapter, because I think it can sum up also how I feel not, this is how I felt when I met you and it's how I feel about all humans because I fundamentally respect them. And I'm talking to any listener because we all have the same capacity. We have different strengths. You know, we talked about some of yours, Mike, which are, which are weird, which are, you know, you're a writer. I mean, you know, you, you're a felon. You're, I mean, my point <laughs> is, is like, we all have our weird histories, but we also have our strengths that we may not even uncover and you never know where they're going to lead. And, and you're, you're a shining example of all that. You know, I'm my own, I have my own story, obviously. Love Sack has its own story, which is also pretty fantastic and strange. 
but we're very different people. I, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to crack the, the, you know, the, whatever the social media game I originally hired you for. And it just shows, you know, we're very different people. We can both have a success in our own way. Um, but, uh, from the book, there are not enough pages in any book to recount all of the steps, hurdles, plans, realities, difficulties, systems, procedures, forms, licenses, relationships, contracts, hires, projects, processes, culture, capabilities, consultants, and ideas that got us here. It wouldn't be useful to you if I did, but I can tell you that all things are possible. There's nothing you can't do. Yes. You're living yes. proof of that. So way yes. to go. So I good to reconnect you, on the back end. Holy cow. I love you, bro. I really do. And you're, you're so important to me, dude. And so important to, to, to my life, bro. And it's, it's, Thank I'm you. so happy that you Thank did you. this. And, and I should say also, uh, one of my favorite things to say right now is I'm actually not a felon anymore. <laughs> I'm not a felon anymore. I got my charges pardoned Amazing. by the state of Connecticut, right. which was uh, just a real great final, uh, you know, nail in that coffin for me. And, um, you know, so, so, you know, but, uh, it's, 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 it was awesome to catch up with you. I, I this was, this was easily one of the, the, the most meaningful podcasts. I mean, we talked about a lot of good stuff today and, and I hope the audience, uh, sees it the same way. And, you know, I'd love to catch up and do it again whenever you want. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. Anything you want to plug? Anything? No, coming I, don't up? I don't know. You know, I, I guess I never, I always hoped I'd get to a point where I don't have to plug anything. I mean, I mean, I guess, I guess the next thing right now for me is 1010 burger. Um, you know, obviously socials, Hey, big Mike, uh, you know, everything's out there, but, uh, fit vital. If you want to read about addiction, if you want to read about recovery and, and, you know, the will to go on and success thereafter, read the fit vital on Amazon. And then if, you know, 1010 burger, we're working on it. It's moving quick. I think I've created the, the best smash burger on the planet and hopefully you'll be putting it in your mouth soon. <laughs> hey, you, I better, I better know about like some kind of like event or whatever, by the way. Uh, well, be, you got to no, hang out with this thing up also, for, for for two, three minutes. So make sure you don't drop right after we're done. Okay. But uh, 10, 10 burger. Hey, big Mike, the fifth vital, check it all out. Um, you can follow Mike on social media at Hey, big Mike on one of our, uh, the most popular podcasts in the world, still impulsive with Logan Paul and George Janko and on his own podcast, the night shift, anywhere you like to get your podcast. He's not only the writer of the best selling book, the fifth vital, but uh, it's, it is about him, his life experiences, etc. He's been more than generous with his time today. Extremely vulnerable and honest. Holy cow, man. Thank you for that. With all of it to the point where it will leave you blushing, wanting to vomit if you read this book. Escape addiction or perhaps avoid it for the balance of your life on earth. It's such an impactful book. Anyone should read it. Uh, the Baron of Burgers, the Oracle of Instagram, the Yoda of YouTube, and the pop star of podcasting, Mike Malak. Thank you, brother. I love you, man. Congratulations. Appreciate you, man.